Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Transform Sales Podcast. Today, I am in great company. I have Dr. Jim Kenichrial. How are you, Dr. Jim? Well, I'm I'm fantastic. You nailed my uh, my pronunciation of the last name. So very few people get that right. So I'm uh, I'm happy to be here, and uh, we're starting off the show on a really strong footing there. Yay! It is because my name is so hard to say. And so when somebody asks me how to use pronounce it, I really try to lean into it. So I try to say people's names right when I can. So let me tell you guys a little bit more about Dr. Jim. He is a researcher, writer, and podcaster. If you have not listened to his podcast yet, you should definitely do it. But he helps leaders, people, and organizations drive transformations by helping them build elite, diverse teams. He also makes sure that talent in your talent strategy doesn't get left behind. I love that. Talent in your talent strategy, not getting left behind. That's awesome. So tell us, how did Dr. Jim start his career to become this amazing person who is so focused on diversity and teams and sales and everything? Tell us about that journey. Uh, I, I don't know about how amazing all that is. It's a, it's kind of like the ultimate nerd story. Um, so, I mean, I think, uh, I think in broad strokes, if we're talking about how I got to where I'm at right now and where I'm heading, uh, I'm a generation zero immigrant. Um, and I've referenced this in sort of the earliest episodes of, uh, of my podcast, uh, that I host with, uh, myself and, uh, and Lawrence Brown is that we were so poor. I'm originally from India. We were so poor that uh, the, the trigger that, that flipped us coming to the U.S. was me basically melting down in the middle of a grocery store because we couldn't afford an apple. So I'd seen an apple for the first time, uh, wanted it, couldn't afford it. And my mom you know, decided at that point, you know, I got to get a better life for my, for my kids. And that started the process of coming to the U.S., so how that ties into kind of where I'm, I'm at, I've always had this sort of grinder, um, hungry personality or aspect about uh, myself um, because of where I came from. And, you know, in terms of how I got to where I'm at right now, I've always been uh, a super nerd. Like there are so many different things that interest me. And I like to go deep in those areas. But in general, the world is just interesting to me. So I like to have at least a baseline level of knowledge across any number of things. And one of the things that I noticed as I was early in my career and then progressing through is that organizations and companies are always looking at, we got to get more people, we got to keep the funnel going in terms of pipeline. But the area that always gets forgotten is internally, You're always obsessed about bringing people in, but what are you doing to keep the people that you have? Um, And oftentimes the culture within organizations isn't set up in a way where you can have those sort of conversations and talk about what's your vision for yourself? Where do you want to go? That sort of stuff. And that actually informed a lot of my my research and areas of interest. And that really is where I, I became passionate about retention, turnover, development, DEI issues, all of these sort of things. It took time as I got further and further involved. And that's kind of how I got here. Um, I've been fortunate in that I've always been able to tie these nerd areas into what I do. I mean, I have that long ass title that you just read, but you know, essentially (laughs) I'm in sales. So I've, I've worked very deliberately in integrating my talent strategy passions into the roles that I've had. I've had talent adjacent roles in technology, talent adjacent roles in staffing. Um, You know, I'm in a SaaS technology organization right now that is focused on driving diversity in the workplace. So it's kind of like a, you know, a process that led to kind of where I'm at and who knows where it's going to go because I'm going to keep grinding in these areas and who knows where that will take me in the, in the long run. So hopefully that helps uh, give you a little bit of a uh, little bit of background. That gave me a whole lot. So you talked about being a generation zero immigrant. Help enlighten us on what it means to be a generation zero immigrant and what those early years were like for you acclimating into um, the U.S. I think what's interesting about um, fitting in in that immigrant journey is that I had the benefit uh, when I was in India 
that English is the national language along with Hindi and a couple of other things that uh, uh, is going to be based on what region you came up in. So I already knew English and I was speaking English fluently when I came over here. But, um, you know, the adjustment period was was pretty interesting. I had an advantage where I could communicate and I could communicate um, with an English accent. So like a British speaker's accent at the time. So I came over when I was seven. Um, but I'd never seen like one of the interesting stories about my my first experiences here Um when we came over, one of the stops that we had before we switched to a, a different plane to come to Chicago was in New York and it was in LaGuardia. And at the time, they didn't have the terminal. They had those little trucks with stairs in it. And here I am as a seven year old kid, never seen snow before. We came over in December. So I'm I'm thinking that when these stair things came up to the to the door, I was racing to the front to be the first off. And I look and the first thing that I see is you know, a layer of white stuff that's this high. And I'm thinking America is freaking great because there's sugar everywhere. So I grabbed a <laughs> handful of it before, <laughs> before, before my dad could like grab my hand and stuck it in my mouth. And I was disappointed in terms of, well, this isn't sugar, it's cold. Um, but that was one of my first memories in coming over to the States. The adjustment period as an immigrant was made easier because of my ability to communicate, but there were a lot of cultural differences and things like that. And this was, you know, in an era where, you know, immigrants were probably even more, um, I don't, I don't want to say frowned upon, but it, it, there was more animosity to an immigrant community at that time than there is now. Um, but I think beyond that, um, you know, where I lived, it was the Chicago suburbs. So we lived in Oak Park and then we lived in Evanston. So all of these areas were fairly cosmopolitan. So it was an easier transition. I think it would have been a lot, a lot more difficult if I was in middle of nowhere, I don't know, Idaho or something. No offense to anybody that lives in Idaho, but I think that would have been a little bit tougher to make that transition. So as a, um, a child, as a person new to this country, I really love what you said. You're like, oh my gosh, a bunch of sugar. And I can absolutely see how as a child, never seeing snow, how you would think about that. Um, one thing that I know is so true is that the experiences that we have in our childhood, they impact the way that we lead. So what, which of those early experiences do you see helping you become and have developed your leadership style? So I can't really point to anything from my childhood that it, it informed how I lead. Um, I think there's a couple of things that later on in life, in high school and in college that, that you know, provided sort of the baseline. Uh, I always have this entrepreneurial component to my, uh, to, to my DNA. Um, you know, in college, I started like I've been working since I was 13. So I was bussing tables at 13 and, and doing that sort of stuff. So I've, I've been in food service and all that sort of stuff. Um, and just generally being um, understanding or at least trying to be understanding has always been part of my effort. I mean, you, you learn a lot in terms of how crappy people can be when you're bussing tables or waiting on them. Uh, because that that has a wide range of behaviors that you can encounter. Uh, so that informs you to at a certain level, well, you know, this happened, I don't want to be feeling this way. So I'm going to be very deliberate in making sure that I try not to make others feel that way. So those are all like little experiences. But I've always had this entrepreneurial bent, I ran a painting business when I was uh, when I was in college, my parents, my dad, bought a gas station. That's like a rite of passage for every Indian immigrant family, even though he was a social worker, my mom was a nurse. Apparently, they had time on their hands. Uh, and he decided buying a gas station was a good idea. It wasn't. Um, so I ran that for a while. Um, so all of those things built that that need to build things and like iterate and continuously improve within a framework. Uh, but I think the big thing that shaped uh, a lot of my leadership philosophy, it, it actually happened when I worked for Lawrence, uh, LB, my co-host, Lawrence Brown at, uh, at Enterprise, the company that picks you up. And when I was interviewing for uh, a management trainee role, and this was years ago, one of the first things that he said at the time we were there was the reason why I like Enterprise. And for those that aren't going to see the video, 
I'm pointing at my hand and LB and, I, and I'm a brown person. And LB says, the reason why I like about uh, what I like most about working at Enterprise is that this stuff doesn't wash off. So you're evaluated based on the merits of your production and your results versus any other factor. And, you know, that that was an interesting sort of mindset that I adopted throughout my life. And when I've built teams throughout my career, I've always been intentional about building teams around me that are representative of the communities that we serve. And oh, by the way, uh, I've been really lucky in having some phenomenal teams who were just ridiculously elite in, you know, any number of different industries. Um, is there is there a causal relationship? I don't know. But, you know, I've had great people on my team and they I was intentional in making sure that they look the part of the communities I serve. So there's a lot of research that backs that up. In fact, that your actual production and your performance as an organization is going to be related to the diversity. So uh, diversity within the organization. So more diverse organizations have better business outcomes than non-diverse organizations. But, you know, that's uh, that, you know, it's, it's funny how a little comment like this stuff doesn't wash off kind of, plays into sort of a bigger overall employee strategy over the course of a, you know, half a lifetime or whatever the, the actual number of years are. You mentioned that, hey, I don't know what in my childhood impacted the way I lead, but just so everyone knows, since I have children, I believe that you are my child until you graduate from college. So anything up to 21 counts as childhood for me. And so when you talk about really helping your parents run um, a gas station and saying, yeah, that was not a good investment and really understanding at an early age how to think about business and how to think about investments and how to serve people. And then going into this enterprise sales trainee role, probably about 20 25% of the people I interview on this podcast have gone through that program. And so I do think that what they give you in that program, although a lot of people don't stay with enterprise, they really give you a lot of bones and teach you how to sell, teach you how to lead. And those that want to take that and move to another level with it, they've gone on to do really amazing things. Yeah. And, and you know what, that's, that's a phenomenal point that you bring out, uh, Wesleyan is the, the foundation that it gives you, because when we're thinking about decisioning processes, you know, here, here I am never having worked in a corporate environment. I mean, I've run small businesses and all that sort of stuff. And, and I asked the question at some point in training, like, how are we supposed to figure out what we do? And I think this is a, a, a comment that LB gave me. You have three rules that you need to abide by. If it, it, when you're making decisions, if it's good for the customer, if it's good for the company and it's ethical, you have free reign to do and make whatever decision you need to make in the moment. And if you can answer yes to all three of those, you're not going to get a fight from, from me in terms of, you know, why did you do that? Now we might explore like what other options would have been available, but think about that. If you're it, it, like that, that is the mindset that I've carried from that point forward is I want my people uh, or people that are on my team. They're not my people, uh, people that are on the team to always operate in that, you know, framework, because I think it's hugely empowering. And then from a leadership perspective, it takes a lot of the granular, like, um, the granular decision making off of your plate, like you're focused more on the important things, which is helping your, your people become more productive and effective versus answering every little situation that comes up, you're giving them a decision making process or framework that anybody can operate with. And I think that's hugely empowering from a team effectiveness perspective. So you're right, enterprise does leave a great foundation. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say there are some things about that culture or their training that didn't serve me well. Um, and here's what I mean. I mean, this is not going to be like super controversial or anything like that, but it's an organization that has an up or out mentality, meaning mm. you need to either be moving up in the organization or you're moving out. And I think I, I really connected with that because I'm naturally impatient. So of course I'm going to want to progress my career as fast as possible. But there's an element that you learn later on in life about, 
building the discipline for methodical, precise execution and detail orientation that you don't get in that up or or out um, world. So I think one of the things that probably didn't serve me well is that earlier in my career, I probably made decisions too fast on moving out of an organization where I probably would have been better served in having those open conversations with my leadership team and saying, hey, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. How do we make this work where I'm playing in my wheelhouse within the organization versus let me go find what else is out there and then just repeating this cycle over and over again where instead of instead of being disciplined and introspective and having the courage to have those conversations you just keep introducing yourself into the same culture and you don't really like get the staying power and the benefits of staying power so there's there's that aspect of it too sorry for the monologue <laughs> That's absolutely okay. So going back to one of the first things that you said, uh, I just wanted to make sure I heard it right. It, you said that what's most important in decision making is um, what's right for the customer, what's right for the company, and your ethics. You, you didn't say anything about making money, about being what is good for you as a salesperson, make the boss look good, right? T- talk to us about that a little bit more. Well, I mean, I think I think if you do those first three things right, and I would argue two out of the three are critical. One is do what's right for the customer. That doesn't mean the customer is always right. So I want to be clear there. Do what's right for the customer and be ethical. If you do both of those things, everything else will fall in line. I think where where sales professionals get this stuff backwards is that in 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 everything that say that the broader world of sales does and this is why people recoil whenever they have a salesperson interact with them is it's all focused about me it's all focused about our product it's all focused about what we want and what's important to me nobody really cares nobody cares about you nobody cares about your company nobody cares about what's important to you people are operating in the world from a position of I need to advance my own initiatives. So if you as a seller and a modern seller is a problem solver, if you really orient yourself outward to how can you help your broader customer base solve the problems that they have and be obsessed about the problem, that's actually going to advance everything that you want without you actually overtly advocating for those things. So there's a reason why I mentioned those three things, because if you do those three things, do what's right for the customer, do what's right for the company, do what's right uh, from an ethics perspective, everything else falls in line. And, you know, the fourth thing that I would add, and this is not something that, that came from enterprise. If you're a seller, you need to be oriented in a way where you're giving two or three times more to the world around you than what you ask. And that informs how we do follow-ups, that informs how, uh, how we engage in conversation, that informs uh, us, us on every interaction that we have. And people are going to get that, oh, this person is different. Andy Paul always talks about how do you rise above the sea of sameness, right? And that's how you rise above the sea of sameness. And if you think about it, how low of a bar has sales set when being generous in a general sense is like the, the aspirational goal, right? Like that's, that's the thing. It's, it's amazing to me. I think the really amazing part about how we both met is we were just following each other, enjoying each other's posts because we hold a lot of the same philosophies. We're not trying to sell each other anything, right? We're trying to learn from each other because another key thing that you didn't mention about, top salespeople, leaders that want to develop is that they always are trying to figure out how can I get a little bit better? What can I learn today? What's the one thing that I can tweak and how can I really take this to the next level? So you talked about all of this amazing, all of these amazing things that you did in your early life and early career. I'm curious about these two letters that you have in front of um, Jim. Well, tell us about that. How did that come to be? So this this is going to circle back to the uh, to to the Generation Zero immigrant story. So, you know, I, I'm not saying this to be offensive to anybody, but ev- just about every Indian mother dreams of their children becoming doctors. I can't stand the sight of blood, so there was no way that I was going to be a doctor. 
but I wanted to make sure that my mom would have something to brag about. So eventually I decided, well, I, I, I got to do something to get this doctor uh, title in front of my name. So I went and got my uh, completed my doctoral research. It was probably like six, seven years ago at this point, but it was in talent strategy. And, and actually, the the research is uh, it, it's uh, it's essentially on why people join and leave organizations. So yeah. again, it was part of you know it was employee retention and turnover uh, within the staffing industry context. And even at that time, this was several years ago when. Uh, when I started that process, I was always thinking about how can I add value to my hiring managers that I'm, I'm trying to build relationships with. And while everybody else in staffing is basically smiling and dialing, trying to pick up the phone and saying, hey, what roles do you have open that we can help you fill? My approach is how do I build, this was even before brand identity or any of that branding stuff was even on my radar. My, my thought process was how do I approach these conversations from a peer position at a minimum, but ideally, how do I approach these conversations with hiring managers from a position of authority from the perspective of helping them solve their talent strategy? And that was just one piece of it. Uh, it, it and it was an intentional piece. It was an expensive intentional piece, but you got to invest in yourself to build that sort of credibility. And this was just one piece of that that exercise. I want to help organizations. This this was 10 years ago that, that I'm thinking about this stuff, maybe 15. Um, I want to help organizations solve their talent challenges. So how do I do that and approach it from both a tactical and strategic perspective, which has massive value implications for the person that I'm dealing with? And that's that's how I ended up, you know, finishing out the the, the degree. So you were you were the good son. Um, my I am actually a first generation uh, American. My parents are originally from Jamaica, and in our culture, it's like you're gonna be a doctor, you're gonna be a lawyer, you're gonna be an engineer. You got to get some kind of advanced degree. And so I majored in chemistry. I'm a chemist, and I was like, yeah, but this is this is gonna be it. I did dibble and dabble in graduate school, um, bits and pieces here and there. But I was like, yeah, this is not it. And then when I was like, oh, I'm going into sales, they're like, you're doing what? Sales? No, 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 no. You can't, you can't do that. That is not an honorable, that's not what you do. You're going to start your own business? But what, okay, what are you actually selling? I was like, what do you mean? This is a service. Like it was a foreign concept to them. So I do understand the, the different ways that parents, like immigrant parents, they think, and it's because of the hard upbringing they had. They always had to work so hard for everything. And so they want their children to be set up on the best path. And the second part of what you said is I really, it really gave me goosebumps in listening to, yes, I wanted to satisfy what my parents wanted for me, but I also was very intentional about what I wanted this degree to do for me. And the fact that you are currently working in a place where you can use all of that and you bring all of that to work, I think is the full circle of really connecting, hey, this is what my parents wanted for me. This is what I desire to do. And this is what I enjoy doing because I can listen to you talk about things in terms of talent strategy and diversity all day long because you have so much depth behind you. So I, I, I have to be honest about all of that. Um, and I think that depth is developed from all of these conversations that I have with people all over the place. Yeah. Like I'm not really like, this is not all stuff that I've thought up. This is me constantly asking questions to the point of being annoying to a lot of people um, about how do you do this? How do you do that? Why is that important? Um, and, and that's the, actually going back to something that you mentioned earlier, how you like my side of the, the story of how you and I connected comes rooted from, from one question. What do I need to be doing to connect with more people and have more real conversations. So I asked that question to a whole bunch of people. And Leslie Vanetz was one of the people that we connected with. And uh, we, we know Leslie. And she gave me like a list of people that I need to talk to. So you were on that list. And I think you were like the second person that I mentioned. It was in no particular order. But I was like, okay, well, I got to get around these people and, and find out what they're doing. And that was... Like I'm constantly looking at how can I get, you know, there, there's somebody in my network uh, named Ade and he taught his tagline is my goal is to be 1% better than I was yesterday. 
And that's really my mindset for, for forever. And when we're, when we're thinking about, you know, the intentionality and all these different areas that, uh, that I can, uh, that, that I can talk about, it's a function of just having these conversations with everybody in my network. I'm, I'm always looking for different ways to kind of understand, you know, this great big world that we're in and all the interesting things that happen. And some of that stuff just gets stuck in your head and like rewires sort of your perspective. And I think the longer that you can stay in that mode where you're acting like a three-year-old and asking questions about everything, the more agile you become, regardless of age, in how you can pick up all sorts of different things. Um, and that for me, it's pretty selfish because I don't, I don't ever want to be in a spot where the world isn't interesting or people aren't interesting because I think it's infinitely interesting and people are infinitely interesting and there's nothing better than finding out their story. Like, how did you get from where you are to where you, where you are now? Or how did you come from where you were to where you are now? That's a great story. Um, and there's so much you can learn from like those sort of conversations. Mm. And so even though you, I, I tried to give you some accolades and praise, you, you put them down and you said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's really not about me. It's about all these amazing people I'm surrounding myself with and how they're helping me grow and develop. And I do think as a leader, that is one of the best things that we can do is really not talk about how amazing we are or how great we are, or all the amazing accolades and things that we have. But when we talk about the journey, we talk about the people who help them get to where we are. And we talk about how we want to pour back and pull those who are coming behind us up. So in your current position, you have a, a team of dynamic people. Share with us one of the, the challenges that you have had um, with leading your team in current days? So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of frame it in, in this respect. So I want to latch on to something that you just mentioned about, you know, hey, pushing off some of the things that you were trying to say and here are the influences behind it. You know, the reason where, why I'm like that, I, I'll blame Lawrence Brown again. Because one of the things that he said from a hiring philosophy perspective was when I'm hiring and and developing people. My mindset is I want to hire and develop my replacement. And that was a formative, you know, thought process as a, as a professional. That's the mindset that I have when it comes to hiring and development. Um, and I think, I, I think generally speaking, if you're brown of any variety, you have some level of imposter syndrome that, that exists where you're like, oh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm good enough at, at this, that, or the other thing. So there's a bit of that that plays in it. But to answer your question about my team um, or the team that we have at Circa, these are phenomenal people. And it's it's like supercharged based off of the mission that we have as an organization. Like how many tech companies are out there that are high growth that are leading with a diversity first mission and go to market with like a ridiculous manifesto. Like you should read that thing. It's, it's crazy. I like did a video on it. So if you have high caliber people that are aligned with a mission and purpose um, versus just high caliber people that are in pursuit of money, um, there's a different element to it. I think when you're asking the question about what, what is the challenge in, uh, in tapping into that, I think one of the areas that, that gets me uh, heartburn is that I have this team of people that are around me who I think are supremely talented, but getting them to see themselves through my eyes is the challenge mm -hmm. because the stuff that I do, like, I think anybody can do it. I think anybody can launch a podcast or do a LinkedIn live show <laughs> or write like it, it, you, you, you have, you have so much information that's out there that you could spin this up over a weekend. Like I launched town strategy 60 over a weekend because I saw an opportunity to help the, uh, talent strategy community level up using community intelligence when we're in the middle of, or approaching an economic downturn. So what happens in that community when, when budgets get slashed? You lose people, you lose resources, you're told to do more with less. And now we actually have the capability of leveraging all of these great practitioners around the, the country 
to share their best practices and help actual talent leaders, you know, d- actually do more with less. Mm-hmm. So I think all of this stuff, anybody can do, but it's getting people to believe in themselves mm-hmm. that they can do it. That's really like where my, you know, revs are focused. Like I, I, I spend a lot of revs in trying to get people to see themselves the way that I see them. Because I think once you unlock that, it's limitless on where you can go to the point like my my first conversations were about, you know, what's your view for yourself? What's your vision for yourself? What, what What's the better life that you're seeking, uh, seeking in this job and in all of your future jobs? Because if you if you lock into that, you're going to have that perpetual accelerator that you can always push and you don't need external factors to do it. So it's tapping into that. That's, that's tricky. And especially as the new person that comes into an organization and, and, and I'm a lot like I, it, my, my manager says I like the boily ocean. It, he's, he's friggin' right. I, I, I think you can take a hundred things all at once. And you and I have talked offline about that sort of stuff. I, 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 I don't have, um, the wiring in my head that says this thing is impossible. I think anything is impossible. I think anything is possible. You just have to figure out how to make it possible. So rant over. (laughs) Rant over. (laughs) It's really a skill to be able to look at someone and really see in them what they can't see in their self themselves and helping them to tap into it right because it's it's one thing to say i see that you're going to be this top salesperson or i see that you're one day going to replace me but it's more so the challenge that a lot of leaders have or don't even know where to start is giving them that roadmap like how do i get from just being ordinary to extraordinary that's my new phrase. I think that's what I'm going to be going into 2023 into. How do we move from being ordinary to extraordinary? What are the things that I need to do? What are, What's the roadmap that I need to get there? And really, as leaders, that is our responsibility. I talk about sales malpractice. I talk about leadership malpractice. And it is leadership malpractice to see a person struggling or to see somebody with untapped potential and do nothing about it. So as leaders, that is our responsibility. It is our responsibility to have our teams shine brighter than we do because it's not about us. We must minimize ourselves and we must elevate the team because once your team succeeds, then you succeed. And as a leader, if you don't have that as the forefront of in your mind of your strategy, then at some point you're going to stumble and you're going to fall. No, I have I have no argument with that. And I think that that's probably one of the gaps that I have as a leader is that I've always been a lead from the front person. Uh, and I think in the in the role that I'm in right now, one of the biggest things that I've had to adjust or at least get better at is building the operational discipline and being more in the background. And, and the jury is still out on whether I'll ever build that operational, you know, metrics focus to the level that I, I needed, needed to be, I, I'm, I I think I'm competent. Um, but the, you know, you, you have to look at what are the things that give you energy and what are the things that take energy away from you? And when I think about what gives me energy, it's, it's being client facing and, and really in a team selling environment, being client facing where I can actually influence the sale by instant messaging, uh, as uh, instant messaging off the side while a rep is actually going through um, uh, the, the, the selling process. Uh, it, where I can influence is auditing phone calls and emails to make sure that they're buyer centric and stuff like that. That's where I have fun uh, prospecting. I have a ton of fun prospecting. Um, I don't know if I'll ever fall in love with the operation side of it. Um, but I don't need to like my, my leadership style is, is rooted firmly in identify what you're strongest at and play to that strength versus focusing on building up your weaknesses beyond a level that gets you to competence. I think you just need to be competence in the air, competent in the areas that you're weak. I don't think, I think the expectation that you be excellent at all things is kind of backwards. Absolutely. As a business owner, as a division leader, as a business unit leader, whatever you are, I do think 
and I agree with this 100% wholeheartedly, you should know how to do everything within your organization, but you don't know how to have, no, how to know, sorry. You don't have to know how to do it well, but you need to understand it at a baseline level so that you can see if the ship is going off track. So if we are running, who knows, reports in our CRM, you should know how to run a report. You don't need to know how to build a report, but you need to know if the data that you're getting doesn't make sense so you can go back to the person building the report to say, hey, can we make some tweaks here? What inputs did you use? Because I'm not getting the right outputs. And as leaders, so many times we think we gotta touch everything. We gotta do everything, but that is not your job. Your job is to be the visionary. Your job is to be the coach. Your job is to be the strategic thinker to lead the organization, to lead your team, and you let them execute. Because if you touch everything, then what you're doing is you're not developing a bench. There's no bench. All the knowledge is in your brain and no one else knows how to do anything else. Yeah. Um, again, no argument there. I think, uh, I think when I look at myself, the gap that I have uh, in terms of leadership style is that there's a lot of stuff that I do instinctively that it's difficult for me to break it down into step-by-step -step process. So I've inserted myself alongside my team generally to show them like, here's what, what you do. And then ask, here's what I do, ask me questions about it. And then we can map it out together for me to like, there, there's so many things that I don't even pay attention to that, that just run on autopilot or instinct it's hard for me to break it down into a process. So that's, that's been the other area where, you know, I I've been aware of it and I'm trying to work that back. But honestly, like I love being in the game, man, <laughs> not to, not to, not to yeah. say man, but I love being in the game, dude. Uh -huh. So it's like, it's, it's, it's tough. For, it's, it's tough to just like back out and, uh, and, and not be client facing. I, 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 man, I, I, I swear, I think if I was just pushing metrics or doing that sort of stuff for all day long, I would drive myself insane. Mm -hmm. That 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 is not fun for me. No. Um so I but that's that's a that's a different story. <laughs> that's a whole different podcast, that's a whole different episode. One tip that I can give you and I give this to my clients often is that in order to build this bench or to extract the things from your brain like you have to become evergreen. I've literally been recording every single meeting that I've had for two years. Why? I don't know. I'm just recording it. And now I have a library of like, I don't know, way too many things, like probably 500 videos and they're all named right. And in the description, I say what we've talked about so I can share that with someone, right? When they come onto the team, I'm like, okay, so you need to do this kind of coaching. You need to work with the, this uh, with a team. It's there because one of the challenges that I have is you ask me what I do and I'm like, I don't know. Like, give me a scenario, right? Tell me what's happening and then I'll respond. And so it's hard for us because we've been doing this for so long and there's so many things in our brain that it's hard to deep dump that information out. And even like sales leaders, I had one that I was working with recently and they're like, well, we're gonna have an in-person and everybody's not gonna be there. I was like, throw on Teams and record yourself. Literally just do it. It doesn't matter if you're in the room, they have the little owl thing that hears everybody when they talk. So just do it. And that's how you start developing all your knowledge, your database, this encyclopedia of Dr. Jim. So Dr. Jim, you have had a very, very fulfilling life, a very amazing career. Can you share one thing that has impacted the way that you lead? Um, I mean, aside from the things that Lawrence um, has mentioned that I, that I referenced earlier in the show, like this stuff doesn't wash off. Uh, you should be hiring with the mindset of hiring a replacement because if you want to actually grow in your career, um, that's the mentality that you should have. Never be afraid of people that are better than you because that's the only way that you're actually going to get better. So there's like stuff that we recapped earlier in the show. But I think that I think the one thing that I don't know where it came from, but, you know, I think the longer that you can operate in the world with the mindset of a three year old. Why is this the way it is? Why does it have to be the way it is? What? could be done differently. All of these questions, um, if you can walk into just about every interaction with that mindset of asymmetrical thinking, the better off you're going to be. And here's why that's important. 
we spend all of our younger life in school, in secondary education, higher education, and we're being drilled into us that the object of the exercise is to find the right answer. And that teaches us to be timid. And I think that is a fundamental failure of the education system. So instead of thinking about and obsessing about getting the right answer, we should be thinking about and obsessing about how can we break stuff? Because if we break stuff, we actually learn the most from that experience. Uh, and, and, and we can actually be more mentally agile in how we go about the world. So always be curious. Don't be afraid to break stuff. Don't be afraid of being wrong because that's actually where your leaps of innovation happen versus just getting the right answer. Getting the right answer teaches you to play it safe. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more boring in life <laughs> than having played it safe. Don't play it safe. I love Thank it. Thank you for attending my TED Talk. Yay! <laughs> I love the TED Talk. So be curious, right? Ask questions. Of when I am mentoring usually young sellers and typically it's women uh, because women as salespeople tend to have, you know, apprehensions, if you will. And I tell them that thing that people told you was so annoying when you were growing up, when you were in school and all your other jobs is what's going to make you really amazing in sales. And for me, it's the curiosity. I would ask why all the time. Like that's why I couldn't work in the lab anymore because I was like, why am I doing this test? Why do you need this new material? And they were like, Wesley, can you just be quiet and do the things? So that curiosity is what helps us continue to grow and develop. As individual contributors, as leaders, as business owners, having curiosity and knowing that it is absolutely okay to fail, right? Failure is not bad. It teaches you something. It teaches you how to tweak and change and then move forward. So Dr. Jim, I know that you have an amazing podcast and there are many things that you're doing out there in the world. Tell us what is the one best way for people to get in contact with you? Uh, if you're looking for one best way, uh, LinkedIn is the way to go. So uh, obviously, if you're connected with West Lean and not connected with me, um, ask for an intro, but you can find me all over LinkedIn. I post daily. Uh, there's a bunch of content that I push out. So that's the easiest way to connect um, with me uh, and the fastest way to connect. It's uh, my most active channel. Awesome. And tell us a little bit about your podcast and what's it called, what it's called. Sure. So uh, Lawrence and I, Lawrence Brown and I uh, run the Cascading Leadership Podcast. Uh, that particular podcast is in season two. So we're not, uh, when we grow up, we want to be like Wesleyan. So we're not quite there yet. Um, but the podcast uh, features uh, senior leaders, uh, women, immigrants, uh, uh, people of color who have risen to senior leadership. And the intent of the show is to share all of their learnings so that you can leverage it as a cliff notes if you're an emerging professional to advance your career further faster. So that's uh, that's cascading leadership. And then I also recently launched Talent Strategy 60, which I referenced earlier in the show. So it's a LinkedIn live show uh, focused on any and all areas of talent strategy and helping the uh, talent strategy community uh, gather best practices so that they can advance their internal initiatives faster than what might be available due to resource constraints. Amazing. So you, you, you don't just have one job or two jobs, like a typical immigrant, you have many, many jobs. <laughs> this is, yeah, I, just I, can't I, be still. I mean, that's uh, you, you, you laugh about the typical immigrant comment, com comment. I hear it all the time. I mean, like I have a pretty diverse network uh, with a lot of immigrants and I don't know a single one that has less than like five jobs. So <laughs> I know, I know. And I'm first generation American and it's still ingrained in my brain. And even my kids are like, yeah, when I grow up, I'm going to have this business and that business and do this and that. So there's nothing wrong with being ambitious. Dr. Jim, this has been an amazing, amazing conversation. You have a thoroughly enriched our lives and help us to transform our sales. So I thank you for your time, your talent, your energy, and most of all the knowledge that you gave us today. No, it was a, it was a great, uh, great fun conversation, but this is not the first time that you and I have chatted. So I'm not surprised that uh, it was, uh, it was fun, but thanks for having me on and I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity, Wesleyan. Thanks so much again. And that was another episode of the Transform Sales Podcast. Remember, each and every day, strive to be 1% better and transform your sales. Until next time.